Welcome to another how-to video from Bugspray.com. This is the first part of a three-phase video presentation in which I'll go over the outline and a plan that will allow you to deal with a problem or potential problem either in the home or around the home regarding small animals. We'll call these animals rodents and the short list of what they might be would include something like a mouse, a roof rat, a Norway rat, a vole, a shrew, a chipmunk, maybe a flying squirrel or a gray squirrel, nothing bigger than a gray squirrel. Now where the problem might be could be anywhere. It could be, for example, in your attic, might be in the pantry, a garage, a crawl space, maybe something inside a wall, could be around the house, meaning outside in the yard. Maybe you're seeing holes alongside your driveway or walkway. So the problem is a small animal and you're seeing something telling you that there is something happening. Now, what it is that you're experiencing can vary. Some people call us and say, hey, I'm hearing a sound in my attic or in a wall void. Others call and say, I'm experiencing or I'm finding droppings in my pantry, attic space, crawl space, in my garage. And still others call or email and say that they're finding new holes underneath a walkway or around a driveway and they're not sure what the animal is that's creating these holes. So in all these cases, people are confused about what options they might have or they're concerned about the situation and they're wondering what can they do. And that's what this first part of my three phase video presentation will address. What is the first step in trying to handle or deal with a situation like this? And in all cases, it's important to understand, first, there's nothing specific about your house or your yard that made the animal come. Oftentimes, we do find correlations. And what I mean by that is a house or a home that has pets is probably more likely to have small rodents. Pet food in general is highly nutritious and small rodents are attracted to it. So it's not uncommon for a house that has a pet rabbit, a pet dog or cat or cattle or horses or some kind of a pet animal where there's a high amount of nutritious food around, which then leads to some type of a small rodent. This is very, very common. When we talk about things like chipmunks or ground squirrels or gray squirrels, oftentimes it's something as simple as a nut tree, something like a pecan tree or acorns. These can all lead to animals coming into the yard. And once they're in the yard, it's almost always going to happen at some point that they get on a structure and then inevitably inside the structure. So in all these cases, there's a few rules that you need to follow if you wanna solve the problem. And before we talk about those, there's also a few myths which we're going to disperse right now and take off the table. And these are things that we hear way too often. The first myth being, hey, by any chance you have some kind of a poison or rodent bait that we can set out that will make the animal disappear and not smell if it dies or dehydrate the animal so that it simply dies and doesn't smell or make the animal leave and never come back. These are all wives tales. There's no such product like this, never has been. And if you're going to use a rodenticide, there is a high risk of A, the product getting relocated and causing issues for a second type animal, what we would call a non-target animal. So secondary poisoning is always a potential when you're using a rodenticide. And for that reason alone, we don't recommend it. The second reason is that oftentimes rodenticide is taken but not consumed. So just because a bait is being taken out of a bait station, it does not mean 
the target animal is actually eating it. It's not uncommon for animals to take any type of rodenticide, relocate it, and then hoard it basically for another day. These are common problems with rodenticides and one of the main reasons why we do not recommend using them. So that's a myth that we want to disperse right now. Make sure that you understand there is no rodenticide that behaves like this. And in general, using a rodenticide just because you're hearing a noise in your attic is a very big mistake. So refrain from doing that. Remove any rodenticide in the house before you undergo the process that I'm about to outline. The second thing that's very, very important is that you do not want to seal up any type of hole that might be used for any animal to enter. If you have found evidence that to suggest that an animal has entered your structure, whether it's a garage, attic, crawl space, living area, whatever, and this hole has some kind of evidence such as chewing marks or something, don't seal that hole up. If you do, the animal will then be forced to go elsewhere, find a new way into the structure, and you must understand that structure is that animal's home. They're not going to abandon the structure just because the hole was sealed up. What they will do is either create a new hole or find another way in, and this is where it can get complicated for you. If you find a hole, that's a huge advantage. This puts you in control. You know where the animal is at. You know where you can then place some uh, lure and food to trap the animal. So these are all pluses that you want on your side. If you eliminate the hole, you're now taking away that advantage. So if you've found the hole, keep it open. This is a very important part of the process and we don't want to mess with that pattern of behavior. Now, why is that pattern of behavior important? Well, that goes into the other reason why structures get animals in the first place and why they tend to have recurring problems once they get an animal. So in general, as I stated before, animals are attracted to a yard based on smell and they're finding something or smelling something, whether it's a nut or pet food, it's something that they are smelling, which gets them to the yard. And once they find or uh, discover the food source, they're oftentimes wanting to live there. This can ultimately lead to them being inside a wall void, an attic, a crawl space, underneath a slab, etc. And why you're forced to deal with the problem. Any type of attractive nuisance around the house can be something that attracts them and you don't want to, uh, again, change that pattern. So if you have food, for example, in a garage, pet food that's being stored, and you're finding some droppings around it, leave the pet food there. You're at an advantage, meaning that you know where the droppings are, you know where the animal is active, and this can allow you to quickly capture the animal and move on with the sealing process and the odor removal process to ultimately stop the animals from coming back. Now, what I mean by odor removal process, this is very, very important and something that most people fail to understand. Animals don't look at a structure and say, hey, this is a good place for me to go. They don't look at a house and understand that this is something humans built and therefore it has food, so I need to move in there. That's not how it works. Animals all rely on the sense of smell as their main governor or their main GPS system. So their sense of smell is what gets them to your property in the first place. And once they're in the property or on the property, the next thing that they will do is mark trails. They're going to leave scent where they're active. This is all designed to allow them to find places easily in the future. So if they leave a structure and they're out foraging for food, they can smell their way back and get inside without much of a problem. These scent trails do not go away quickly. They can last years. And that is why if you remove one, two, three, five animals from an attic or a crawl space or in your pantry or a garage, and you don't have any activity for two weeks or two months or three months, and then all of a sudden, six months later, you have new animals there, it's because those new animals follow the scent trail that was in place. Ultimately, removing those scent trails is basically taking away their roadways and their highways that lead to your structures. 
And if we can do that after the animals that are active are removed, you can prevent further or future infestations. And we'll get into that in part three of this three-phase video presentation that I'm making. For now, I've outlined a lot and given you a lot of information, but what I want to get to right now in this video is what you need to do, what I would call step one when dealing with any type of animal activity, small animal activity in or around the home. So again, let's say that you're experiencing a sound in the attic or you found some droppings in your garage or in your crawl space. Maybe you discovered something in the pantry that was opened up and you suspect an animal has gotten in there and has chewed on something. All of these are clues or what we would call evidence that there's been some type of an animal in the home. It does not mean the animal is living there. It could possibly have been an animal that was passing through. He came inside or she came inside, didn't find a comfortable enough place to stay, moved on and left. But to be sure, this is what you need to do. It's very simple. Get yourself some of alpecan paste and some mixed seed. This would be basically any kind of a bird seed. We sell these in small little baggies. And what you want to do is make a placement where the animal or where the sign is presented in the home. So this might be in the attic. It might be in a crawl space. It might be in a pantry, a garage. It might be alongside a driveway. Any place that you're seeing any type of evidence or think that you've seen an animal and are wondering, is there something that's living here? So what you'll do is get some of the pecan paste. This particular jar looks like it's been used, and it has. This jar is several years old. I've almost emptied it. If you look inside, you can see that it's virtually empty. I have had this, like I said, several years. I can't even remember, three or four. It has trapped over 25 animals at this point. I'm not exactly sure how many, but it has trapped everything from squirrels to chipmunks to voles roof rats, mice, and I think that's about it. I may have caused something else, but the point is animals cannot resist this. Now what I do if I'm finding evidence either in an attic space, in my garage, or around the house, I will set out what I call a pre-bait offering, and the goal of this is to see if there's anything active, because if there is something active, it will readily accept the offering. And that's phase one. So inside or in a soda cap, this is a very standard bottle cap actually. I took this off of Dasani water. Or you can use the bottom of the Dixie cup. All you need to do is place about half a teaspoon of the pecan paste inside this little tray or in this case a bottle cap where you see the droppings, where you have seen evidence of an animal. The point is you're making an offering to the animal. Also sprinkle a little bit of bird seed. A teaspoon of bird seed sprinkled over the pecan paste is a great combination. For all these animals, bird seed is something they're naturally aware of, something they've seen before. And the pecan paste is a very strong smelling pecan based lure, which will flow odor-wise great distances. Animals can easily smell this 50 to 100 feet away. So any placement of this will pull them in. And once you've made this placement in the evening, right before dark, you want to inspect it the next morning and then the next evening. And what you're looking for is any acceptance of these placements. Now, how many placements should you make? That just varies on the situation. If you have three or four uh, uh, places in the home where you've seen evidence, make three or four placements. The goal here is simple. We want acceptance of the initial offering. And once you can get the animals uh, taking the offering, we can then move on to step two, which will involve using one of these traps. We have a couple of live traps. We have a couple of kill traps. This is how we will solve the problem. It will be with the use of traps. But the first part of this process is pre-baiting and getting the animals used to feeding at one specific location. And we do that with our pecan paste, and we do that with a little bit of bird seed. So get some of these two products, you'll see links below, 
And once they're placed out and you get acceptance, you can move on to step two or phase two in this three-part video presentation. And that will include using the traps so that we can capture the animals which are active. So thank you for watching this how-to video from bugspray.com.